before the session starts, I want to explain what, why I'm also happy that David Rowan is a back on the DLD stage, a good friend. He was the former editor of Wired UK. He founded it even, and is an expert and reporting on new technologies. You are. Thank you are still Steffi. are. Good. He, I, I have to say, David is also a successful investor and founded Voyagers, a network of mission-driven people who want to accelerate positive impact. So, anything to add? You've hit the news. There's something about to happen tomorrow, weather permitting, that this man on stage is going to be responsible for the world's first hydrogen electric flight in a 20-seater commercial plane 20 in the UK. Wow. So you like being slightly ahead of the news yeah. agenda, Steffi. It's amazing. You know, you we, had, we started the conference with Oliver Zipser, the CEO from BMW. And now we end the conference with Vival Miftakov. The, and, and Oliver spoke about hydrogen and the next future for the cars. And now you speak about hydrogen, about the future for airplanes. So it's a good closing circle. Thank you. Thank you, Steffi. Thank you, Val. So just to set the context, five years ago, Val set up a company. He's a serial entrepreneur. He sold a previous company. He's worked at Google and McKinsey. But he, so, he started a company with a mission to create zero emission flying. And it's a pretty big challenge because it's not just the hardware and the fundraising and the regulatory hurdles. It's persuading the world, the aviation industry, which is quite conservative, that you are the future. So five years on, Zero Avia, He's raised about $150 million, 250 people. Bases in the UK and the US and has achieved a bunch of world's first. The first fuel cell powered commercial aircraft flight in Europe, the first hydrogen pipeline in an airport, 1,500 engines on pre-order. Um, but Val, let's talk about tomorrow's scheduled flight. How important is it that you've got regulatory approval to have a 20-seater plane powered by hydrogen electric? Thank you, David. No, it's uh, hugely important because um, uh, this is our third prototype. So our previous two prototypes were six-seat aircraft. Uh, so already the largest um, uh, hydrogen electric aircraft in flight, um, but this time around we're putting a commercial size engine uh, that will be used in our commercial size uh, aircraft uh, that we're looking to launch for uh, full commercial passenger and cargo use in 2025, so two, two and a half years out. Uh, so this engine that we're testing, we're starting to test in flight, um, and next iteration of that will go into commercial uh, aircraft. So this is really important for the company, really important for the industry, and uh, as you mentioned uh, correctly, we are the only company that flies these size of aircraft uh, with new propulsion. And we really need this new propulsion, uh, zero emission, true zero emission um, aviation to succeed if we are to change the trajectory um, of aviation and the climate change. Because we, we cannot continue combusting fuel at high altitude. We need to go from combustion to uh, electrified propulsion. There's a lot of controversy around hydrogen as a fuel. It's easily combustible. It takes a lot of energy to produce it. Why do you see hydrogen as the future of aviation? Yeah, well, let's see. Uh, we think that this is the only thing that will work, really, uh, in aviation. Because um, if you if you start from the from the main reason why we're all working on different fuels, uh, different propulsion technologies, it's about uh, eliminating the climate impact of aviation. And if you look at the climate impact of aviation, two thirds of it are coming from non-carbon sources. So the carbon in the emissions from the aircraft is only one third of the total climate impact for aviation. Two thirds, and this is by now um, academic consensus all over the world, 
uh, and half the industry agrees uh, already. So two-thirds of the climate impact come from high-altitude combustion effects. So this is nitrogen oxides, uh, this is high-temperature water vapor, particulate emissions. And if you go to, let's say, sustainable aviation fuels, you have, still have all of those. Even if you go to hydrogen combustion, you still have most of those, and arguably even more so on the uh, water vapor and nitrogen oxide. So you're not solving the largest part of the problem. You're at most solving 30%, and 30% with a growth rate of aviation gets you maybe seven to 10 years. Um, so, and then what, right? So then what are you gonna do? Then you need something else. So with hydrogen, uh, and especially hydrogen fuel cells, which is what we are doing at Zero Avia, you can get 20x improvements. Um, and that's, that's when you're talking. That's when you really can, you know, look each other uh, in the eye and say, by 2050, we can have aviation substantially reduced, even with the growth rate that we're expecting. But I talk to senior people in the aviation industry, and their attitude is, look, we're just two, maybe three percent of global CO2 emissions, give us a break, take the pressure off us. Mm -hmm. We're just highly visible, but we're not the cause of the problem. How would you answer that? Yeah, well, uh, two or three percent of carbon times three, so that's up to, let's say, six to nine percent of the total impact uh, per the point that we just talked about. So that starts already being sizable. And then if you look at growth rates uh, for aviation, of course, during pandemic, everybody was like, well, you know, we don't know if aviation will survive, but we're all here. Uh, so, uh, you know, you see full planes, uh, staffing shortages, uh, all the airlines are scrambling to come back uh, at scale. Um, so really the market is there and the growth rate is there, three to five percent a year over year. You fast forward that to 2050 when, you know, we have power sector that's fully decarbonizing, right, with the renewable. Renewable energy is now the cheapest energy you can, you know, if you build a new plant, you, you build a solar or wind plant, right, nothing else. Um, transportation, ground transportation is all going electric. Uh, so what's left are these industries like aviation that are already up to 9% and then everybody else getting closer and closer to zero. This becomes larger and larger percentage, relatively speaking. So that's, that's going to be a big problem. Some estimates out there, 25, 50% by 2050, if we don't do anything, will be climate impact from aviation. And then you look at the fleet longevity in aviation, the Aircraft that is bought today by Lufthansa Group, for example, will last for 30 years, right? That aircraft is going to be in the markets, in the fleets, for 30 years. So 30 years, we're banking that emission trajectory for, yeah? And in 30 years, we're already beyond 2050, and in 2050, we want to be in that zero. So it's clearly not going to work. So you need the solution. So by 2050, we could have the equivalent of 25 to 50 percent of all carbon emissions coming from aviation. Now, clearly, the airlines themselves are supporting you partly because they, they know this solution. is a problem. So your investors include United Airlines, British Airways parent company IAG, um, Alaska Airlines, but you've also raised from Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and Shell and a bunch of others. What do the airlines expect the passenger experience to be within this decade? I mean, you talked about having potentially the first commercial flights in a couple of years. How long will those flights be? Will there be a higher cost to the passenger? Will the experience be different? Yeah, so the seat mile uh, cost is going to be at or lower. Uh, than um, uh, comparable jet fuel cost. For smaller, we start with regional aircraft, smaller aircraft. So for regional aircraft of this size, uh, the engines are especially inefficient. The uh, uh, combustion engines are especially inefficient. They're actually less efficient than in your combustion car, which is notoriously inefficient. And when you go you know, electric, you make massive leaps in efficiency. Uh, it's a similar story here. When you go hydrogen electric, um, much more efficient for small aircraft especially. Um, and that drives e better economics um, for those. And uh, two years out, we already have some operators that are uh, uh, placing, I think we have 600 uh, of those 1,500 pre-orders that you mentioned are for smaller aircraft um, that are these sub-regional routes, 300 miles, 400 miles, 
uh, type trips, um, that 95% of the missions for that aircraft are those short trips. Mm -hmm. And then five years out, um, we are powering up uh, 700, uh, 70 seat, uh, 80 seat aircraft for 700 miles. And that again is 95% of all trips that that aircraft does are below 700 miles. So we really, when we go to the operators, we give them this uh, story that is both economical and green, and it's practical, and we're proving it you know, with every flight, and that's why um, th that flight tomorrow uh, hopefully does happen, um, weather uh, permitting in England, which is uh, uh, a, a tough uh, condition to meet uh, in the middle of the winter, but um, uh, you know, that's why those flights are important, because they show the operators that we're moving step by step towards that future where um, they will be able to put passengers there. And yet, hydrogen. Is it safe? You had a bit of trouble in April 2021 with one of your small fuel cell and battery prototypes crashing near Cranfield in the UK. Um, it lost power. I think the batteries switched off. Another prototype was damaged as you were um, going through the installation process of a fuel tank. How concerned should we be that this is still an unproven technology in an industry which is built on safety? Yeah, absolutely. So by the way, in both of those incidents, um, the hydrogen system was actually not in the part of the uh, uh, chain of events. Uh, at all, right? So, and the hydrogen systems that we put together were um, all intact through all those sequences. And uh, uh, actually, in the uh, in the later incident that you mentioned, um, the uh, emergency response group that uh, attended to the event uh, was actually quite surprised that there was no, there is nothing to attend to, right? So, um, uh, we've actually shown uh, with that, if, you know, not. Not the, uh, not the intended demonstration that uh, I wanted to have, but uh, it was demonstrated that the systems um, are actually quite safe. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we didn't have any unintended release uh, of hydrogen, nor uh, the battery event, so everything was safe. Um, and most of the uh, uh, causes of the, uh, of the incident were tracked to the human error. Uh, and yet so. hydrogen isn't the easiest fuel, fuel to use. In liquid form, it needs to be at minus 253 degrees. In gas, it needs yep. to be under high pressure. Transportation of the hydrogen itself is a challenge. You've chosen a really difficult path. Yeah, but then again, uh, true. Um, but then again, you know, a couple of points. One is, for aviation, we think that that is the only thing that will work. The batteries will not work for a long, for a long haul, and even a medium haul in large aircraft is just not enough um, energy density in the batteries or cycle life, and uh, even from the theoretical perspective. Um, and then we need to get away from combustion, which means that we need to go electric routes. If batteries are not the, one, not the source of energy, then what, right? So the, you, you actually, logical elimination, right? And you know, we, we have pretty scientific backgrounds at the company. Hydrogen is the only thing that will work long-term. So it is, it is the best long-term solution. So you have to make it work. And then um, there was actually research uh, uh, from folks like at NASA in the US and some of the others. Uh, most recently, I think, ATI, Aerospace Technology Institute in, uh, in the UK, did, uh, did a safety study on uh, various uh, aviation fuels. And they said uh, hydrogen can be actually made as safe or safer than jet fuel. And there are some parameters of hydrogen that lend itself to, to higher safety. Like, for example, ignition temperatures are higher. Uh, it's very hard to maintain um, flammable concentration uh, in the atmosphere, right? It dissipates very, very quickly. Uh, so a typical, you know, one of the typical um, accident sequences for standard planes, and we had some of those in the last uh, few, uh, few years, um, you know, as an industry, is on, on landing you have fuel leak and then fuel uh, ignites uh, on contact with hot brakes, uh, and then you have a post uh, landing fire. Right? That's just impossible with the uh, uh, with the hydrogen plane. Because first, you're gonna, if you have a leak, then it's going to evaporate uh, up in the atmosphere. And even if it's going to go uh, near your uh, your hot brakes, the the ignition temperature is not enough, uh, or the temperature of the brakes is not enough to ignite. Right. So there are safety parameters of hydrogen that actually are better than jet fuel. Even so, let's assume we crack the safety. Is the airplane 
going to need to be designed from scratch in a different way. You're partnering with um, a new company, Otto Aviation, whose design is different. But can we simply retrofit today's aircraft that maybe have that 30-year life? Yes, we do. Actually, we have uh, partnerships right now with uh, seven uh, different aircraft manufacturers. <clears throat> so Otto is a good example of a uh, uh, clean sheet design that we're doing together um, on the aircraft, 10 to 20 seats uh, with hydrogen engine. But we also have uh, partnerships with Textron, which is the largest uh, manufacturer of small aircraft in the world, uh, including commercial small aircraft. We have partnership with Duhamel in Canada, which is a large turboprop. Uh, aircraft, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, regional jet, uh, the regional jet manufacturer. So with all of those, the first target is uh, to enable retrofits of the existing fleet. And then a lot of airlines uh, like United American, those CRJ regional um, jets are half-life. Yeah? And uh, the engines are the parts of the airplane that give them trouble, maintenance-wise, uh, you know, efficiency, performance. So they are looking forward to um, a zero-emission option to put in those planes. Okay. And then with every of those manufacturers, we also go into a line fit, uh, what's called line fit relationship, where we can, you know, United, having flown a retrofitted uh, regional jet, can go back to the Mitsubishi and say, we need 20 more of those, but now with zero IV engines, new ones with zero IV engines, and we're able to do that. I've got one final question, Val, which is how you personally chose to give up a nice career at Google and McKinsey. You sold an electric vehicle charging firm, eMotor e Works. You had some money. You chose for your next chapter something with barriers all over the place, regulatory hurdles, new technology that needed a lot of funding. It wasn't going to happen quickly. What do you think it was in your upbringing that made you determined to follow possibly the toughest choices? Mm, good questions. Uh, definitely a reality distortion somewhere there. But um, uh, no, I'm very passionate about aviation. Uh, from uh, from my childhood years, uh, you know, my father was in uh, avionics. Uh, well, you grew up in the Soviet Union. Soviet Union, yes. And you yeah. only came to the U.S. in 1997. 1997, yes, yes. So you had a, an aviation conversation at home, I guess, if your father was. Yeah, in the yeah. Industry. In fact, uh, I remember drawing up, uh, you know, little pictures of airplane designs and all that, even with uh, with hydrogen back then, because uh, that was, you know, choice rocket fuel for some of the rocket operations. So it was uh, very, uh, very sexy at the time. And um, you, you yeah. took a PhD at Princeton. But when you arrived in America, how much money did you have in your pocket? A couple of hundred bucks. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, that was this. Uh, you, 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 can, you can call that entrepreneurial adventure in itself, uh, basically, uh, coming onto to the U.S. But you trained to be a pilot pretty soon. That's right. That's right. So helicopters, airplanes, so really passionate about aviation personally. And, um, you know, my previous uh, company was already in the sustainable, uh, sustainable transport space. So as I was thinking about what's next, uh, naturally, you know, looking at the... Um, all these negative connotations about aviation that uh, were uh, coming into press and uh, into public consciousness, I, I, just, I just needed to do it. just needed to go there and uh, combine the passion and, uh, and the previous experience in sustainable transportation, start Zero Avia. Sounds like we need you to do it as well. So best of luck with the English weather tomorrow, Val. Fingers crossed everything works. Fingers crossed that it persuades the regulators the airlines, but I guess also the passengers, that this is the future. Please could we thank and wish a warm takeoff to Val Mifkatov of Zero Avia. Thank you. Thank you.